Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome. Those of you, I've seen several of you in for a number of panels today. So you've really done the long haul on Careers Week today. We're at the end of day two. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. And a huge, huge, huge welcome to Dr. Amanda Nyman Peters, who is going to talk us through, um, really give us a sneak peek into her brand new book working with influence, which as you can see, I really need. It's a great book <laughs> and uh, I can't uh, wait uh, for her to share it with us. Um, I'm not gonna talk much more because we're going to fill up this time really quickly. But first of all, uh, just to tell you a bit about uh, Dr. Amanda Naiman Peters, who is a professor of leadership at the Holt Business uh, International Business School. Believe it or not, she started university at the age of 16. Which uh, was just uh, quite mild one. Has, uh, has a first class honours degree in psychology, as well as a PhD in behavioural science from Cambridge. And she addresses leadership challenges with really a deep scientific understanding combined with her management experience that comes from a whole host of. Uh, sort of interesting uh, experiences which you're going to share with us so I'm not going to tell you more and most of all the bit I'm most excited to listen to about is your time in a field camp in the Arctic Antarctic Peninsula <laughs> and what that's taught you about leadership so really uh welcome remotely <laughs> from far away but joining us all the way from Canada today so really a huge welcome and the floor is yours thanks Dr Melanie so I thought I'll begin by introducing myself and referring to one of these things that uh, Melanie had mentioned, and that is that originally I started my career as a behavioral scientist working in Antarctica. And so, yep, over on the left there, you can see a picture, and that is me in the red overalls with a pickaxe digging out of the uh, ice the hut that we kept our supplies in. So we left the huts there over the winter. We were only there in the summer. On the right-hand side, you can see the hut that we did our cooking and food preparation in. And just behind that, you can see the tents that we slept in. Each of us had our own tent. But the key in this picture is in the foreground, and that's the Gentoo penguin that you can see. I can tell by looking at it, it's a juvenile. And at one point, I probably was the world's foremost authority on that particular species. Now, one thing about studying penguins that set me up really well for my career in the future is that when you study penguins, you can't ask them what they think. And you see, years later, now that I'm working in a business school and I'm working with humans, I'm able to um, very clearly distinguish between asking people what they think influences them and then actually measuring what does influence them from a science point of view. And what you'll find is that people's opinions and what actually happens diverge quite a lot. So academically, by background, by training, as Dr. Melanie said, I'm a behavioral scientist, first at the University of Adelaide and then at the University of Cambridge. I did a master's, a PhD, a postdoc at Cambridge. And after, after all of that in academia, I was recruited into Procter & Gamble. Um, a large consumer goods company. And I have to tell you for the first couple of months, I was uh, a little bit struggling with, um, with the context. But you see, the context is extremely different from the penguins and from Antarctica, but the skills are transferable. What I'm doing now is using my understanding of behavioral science to measure what influences the behavior of consumers and what influences our audiences. And so that was my key role. I worked for Procter & Gamble in Brussels, in Rotterdam, in London for quite a few years, moved out to Dubai. Um, and after I think it was over 10 years in a company that had 160,000 people globally. I wanted to see what it was like to make all the business decisions for myself for a change. So after more than 10 years with PNG, I started uh, a, a startup, in fact, in Dubai, um, together with a couple of friends. So this company was called Sarah Black International. And on the left-hand side in the little photo there, you can see Dina from Saudi Arabia 
that's me in the middle, and then Deepa from India. And our proposition to our key customers is that we would use a science-based approach to improve the performance of their key employees. Now, from my perspective, I didn't mind if the employee you sent me was performing at a two out of 10 or an eight or nine out of 10. The goal was to increase their capability relative to what it's been before. And this is a theme you're going to see in my presentation. The goal of applying principles of influence is to increase your ability to influence people and outcomes in the workplace relative to what your ability was without using these science-based principles. So as I say, to use my phrase, I don't care right now if you're really weak at influencing or you're really strong. We know that by applying a science-based approach, you can improve relative to your success rate in the past. So while I was operating this company, I was able to win significant repeat business from a number of uh, key clients. During uh, just coming to the end of the time that I was uh, excited about working as an entrepreneur, I was offered the opportunity to be the dean of uh, Dubai campus of Holt International Business School. This little video, a screenshot from a video I put together um, after uh, doing research on people's misconceptions about Dubai, I took sort of the top seven or eight. I made a three minute video on why you should study in Dubai posted that online. It's pretty silly, but it did some of the job. After working as a dean, I led, uh, co-led Holt's global research strategy, helped us get the Equus and AAC, AACSB accreditation, which for a business school is important. And today I'm a full-time professor. I write, I write science journalism also, but predominantly I teach data analysis and leadership development at a postgraduate level. And I love doing this job because I believe I make a difference. I develop data aware, principle driven leaders to be influencers for positive change. The skills that you learn in your education, again, being transferable to the real world so that you can improve not only the, the, the lives of the people who work with you, but who the, the lives of the people who live around you. And that's my career in a nutshell. <laughs> wow. And, um, and that's so uh, for everybody that's wondering, and we've had a number of questions today about sort of career paths, and not sort of being a little bit more wiggly than you sometimes uh, think that they are. That's a great example. And before I take the privilege to ask my next question, I always I was so excited to sort of start asking you questions. I forgot to remind everyone that if you, particularly those online, if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box. We have the fabulous Manasseh with us today moderating who will be uh, asking those questions for you uh, if you're online. So please uh, don't hesitate to put any questions in there so to, to take it on to your book so where it's uh <laughs> you put all this knowledge in for us that can't get to your classroom uh to hear about them uh your book uses a behavioral science approach to really identify these nine principles of persuasion which is a sort of bigger number than the sort of historic behavioral science sort of number of principles uh to apply in the workplace um why is a science-based approach uh, to implement necessary from like, your perspective? Well, just first up, let me address the reason that there are nine principles. Um, as some of you will know, uh, as per Miller's law, uh, the human brain best remembers seven meaningful chunks of information, plus or minus two. So I've taken nine and I've put them into a model. There are three principles related to the people with whom you are interacting. There are three principles related to uh, how you communicate your message. And there are three principles related to your specific behavior and how you act, how you hold your body, what you do in a meeting presentation, in a face-to-face, -face, in an online webinar to increase your influence. And so the whole goal of this three by three by three model is that it's something that people can actually remember because science can't impact your behavior if you don't remember what it is you're supposed to be doing. But let me move on to answer your question, Dr. Melanie. Uh, why is a science-based approach to influence necessary? And the answer to that is really that we're just not really very good at influencing other people. Um, in fact, 
oftentimes if you ask people to indicate for example the message that is most likely to influence them they choose the message that actually has the least amount of impact on people's behavior when you put it out there in the real world and that's because you know we just when you we think okay now is the time i want to influence this outcome this decision this meeting the behaviors that logically occur to you that you should engage in in order to cause influence really aren't as effective as you think they are. For example, um, the most common technique, this has been measured in terms of people in the, in the workforce aiming to influence peers, um, colleagues, you know, not the people who directly report to you because that's, that's not really influence, that's just using, using your position right. But when you're trying to influence colleagues, people in other departments, clients, the most common technique that people use is rational persuasion. And what that means is like using lots of logical reasons and careful, careful explanations as to why somebody should do the thing you're suggesting they do. And that would all work very well if it weren't for the fact that human beings are nowhere near as logical as we tend to believe ourselves to be. So right now, as I'm talking to the audience, some of the people listening will think that, you know, oh, I'm a very rational person and I make my decisions based on logic. And some other people in the audience will identify as somebody who's very sort of driven by instinct and gut feeling. And I know in my heart, a, a sort of emotional decision maker. And I'm to, here to tell you that both of those two groups of people are really kind of wrong about what's actually happening in their brain. So this chart that I've borrowed from a meta-analysis of, of neuroscience is demonstrating the way that our brain acts on information and emotion. And what you can see in this chart is that although there are some thought processes that are purely emotionally driven and some that are purely highly rational and logical driven, driven most of our thought most of the time is both. So if you were to open a cupboard and look at a set of glasses in it, the shelves would be the emotion and the glasses would be the facts. What that means is the shelf comes first. And what our brain actually does, what neuroscience reveals, is that we treat how we feel about something as if it is a source of information. And it's the source of information that comes first. And so here's the thing. It's emotion that predominantly drives decisions rather than logic. And of course, this is really relevant in my sphere where I teach in a business school and I talk about uh, consumer decisions. If somebody has just bought, purchased something, whether it's a shampoo or a brand new car, and you ask them, why did they buy it? They will have a lot of logical reasons. Oh, you know, because the fuel efficiency is so good or because it contains vitamin B12 or blah, blah, blah. But all of that logic comes after as a post uh, rationalization. The thing that drives the attention or drives the desire to buy is the emotional part. This is going to make me look more successful. This is going to be fun. My hair is going to look fabulous. I'm going to be super sexy driving that car. Like whatever is, is hitting that emotion button is coming first and the logic comes afterwards. But here's the thing. When you are asked to try to influence somebody to do something, the predominant technique you'll use is logic. So we attempt to influence people using logic, using reasons, using lots of reasons. But human beings are influenced first by emotion and the logic comes later only if the emotion has opened the person up to that decision. So the question I'm going to ask you now, and I, I don't want you to answer it, I will we'll stop in a moment and allow, you know, at the end of the presentation, there's plenty of time for Q&A. But what I want to do is all the way through my discussion of these principles, I want you to be asking, what could I do about this and write down your insight? I'm going to give you some insights about things you could do. But what research tells us, if you write something that you're going to do, it has a much higher likelihood of actually impacting your behavior versus if I just tell you what you should do. But here are some things to think about based off this principle that we've just been looking at. When it comes to a message that you want to deliver, a recommendation you want to give at a meeting, at a presentation, in an interview, choose your words carefully. Because what you're saying, the logic of it, will come second to how people feel. 
people remember how you make them feel and they use how you make them feel as a source of information just at a subconscious level so they don't know that they're doing it. So I want you to think carefully about the words that you're using. How will this make somebody feel? The second thing that you can do to uh, uh, leverage this emotional response is help other people feel that you are like them. It's not enough to just tell them. You've got to find a way to make people feel you're like them. And here I'm directly referring to principle three from the nine principles of persuasion. Principle three is affiliation. And that refers to the fact that we're positively influenced by people whom we perceive as being like us, as a member of our group or our tribe, if you like. It comes from like prehistory. This person is a member of my tribe. And if the other person feels that you are like them, then there will be a much more positive emotional response. And the little diagram that um, we put together to represent this principle is that we're very primed to see differences between each other. And if you're dealing with someone at work, you, you, know, you might see differences like you're at different seniority levels or some of them have kids and you don't have kids. But what you've got to be looking for is we're focusing on the similarities, what you have in common, because when that brain senses this person is like me, the emotional positivity comes through. And that's principle three. Uh, positive affiliation is something you can use to help you have more influence over people and outcomes at work. So true. <laughs> it's, a, it's an incredible tactic. I mean, I could remember that I went to a really high level job interview once and they asked me, what did I do to relax? And it just sort of came out. I said, like, on a Friday night, I like to have a glass of wine and read a Cosmopolitan. I was like, oh, my God, I've just told them that I read Cosmopolitan. <laughs> and the sort of the, the female interview on the other side said, oh, my God, I do, too. You know, and it was just, you could get, and those types of things, finding a tribe comes in funny places, even Cosmopolitan readers. Um, and that's a great example, Melanie, because that's an example where you were lucky that that applied. But if you think about these things in at first and you set up a strategy, then you're levering science to do a better job than you would do without it. Awesome. It's a really good tactic. So I want to know more. <laughs> if you could, like, I just told me a bit more about some of the principles of uh, persuasion. I mean, I read the book, but I guess I uh, want to hear it directly from you. And uh, I'm sure here everybody wants to know more. Um, what actions could the, the people in our virtual and real audience kind of take tomorrow, either at work, in the internships, or even like as they're sort of searching for jobs in the interviews? Yes. So important. And um, so let me let me dive into I think this is probably one of the easiest principles to apply, but that doesn't mean that it comes naturally or intuitively. It just means that if you think about it, you will be able to do this, but you have to take the time to apply the scientific insight and think about how to do it. So principle four is value framing. And there are three different ways that you can do value framing. I'm just going to focus on one of them in our short time together today. Now, value framing as a scientific principle for influence comes from the fact that when people value an item or make judgments about it, rarely does the item itself have its own inherent value. There are a few stimuli out there called primary stimuli that has, have inherent value, but predominantly we make judgments in a relative manner. So to give you an example, I take this apple. If I want the apple to seem large, I could put it on a table amongst a lot of cashew nuts, for example. If I want the apple to seem small, I could put it in a display amongst a lot of watermelons. The apple has not changed. What has changed is the context around the apple. And that's actually how human brains make judgments is on the basis of, of relative valuations. So I'll give you another illustration. I could pick somebody in the audience. I think I saw Kush's name there previously. And I could pick someone in the audience and, um, and say, hey, I can make you 3,000 pounds for next week. And you know what about this 3,000 pounds is that I'm going to get it directly into your bank account next week. It's not to your company. It's just for you. And it's actually going to appear it online 
in your account next week. Now, this might sound like a really good deal, but what is happening in your head right now is you're creating a story around that £3,000 and you're trying to decide, or it seems automatically, as if it's a good deal because you're thinking about your bank account balance, where it is today, maybe it's zero if you've just finished your degree, right? And now it's £3,000 higher. But if that £3,000 is something that you can make by working for half a day, it's a really good deal. If it's something that you can make by selling one of your kidneys, it's not a good deal, right? Mm -hmm. So again, we create the, the context around that. And I want to give you a, another just an example of a study. Um, this was conducted on a college campus and students walking across the campus were stopped and they were asked, would you be willing to chaperone juvenile delinquents on a day trip to the zoo? Only 17% of people said yes. So they waited a couple of weeks until there were completely new people in the walking across campus. And they asked them, okay, would you be willing to spend two hours per week as counselors to juvenile delinquents for a minimum of uh, two years? Nobody agreed to that. Like, that doesn't sound like a great idea, right? So then they asked them, would you be willing to chaperone a group of juvenile delinquents on a day trip to the zoo? Now more than half the people said yes. Nothing has changed in terms of the request being made of people. What has changed is the context within which you've put the statement. So what I'm going to do again is, um, you know, as I say, there's three different techniques for value framing. Um, I do think it's one of the easiest principles to apply. Let me just give you an example of how you could apply context. If I'm in a presentation and I say that our team sales results were 5% higher than they were last qu quarter, is that good? I guess it's good. It's better than flat, right? But it's not inherently powerful. It's not strong one way or the other. If instead I give you this context across our region, Sales results were down 20% versus, first, uh, versus last quarter. But for my team, sales results were 5% higher. Now my 5% higher looks like an extremely strong performance. What's changed is I've given you information that, that, that controls how you do the relative valuation instead of just leaving it open for you to make it up yourself. Here's another example could be relevant to recent graduates. I put on my CV that I got to be in marketing. <laughs> what? <laughs> like you're just leaving it to me to work out if that's good or not. And the most likely thing that I'll think when I see it is, well, it's not an A, right? But what if instead you told me I was in the top 15% of a highly competitive course? In fact, a, a quarter of the class didn't even pass. Now I think of you in terms of top 15% of the course. And that's a very different perspective from just saying marketing B. In no case do I want you to behave unethically and stretch the truth. I want you to understand that if you don't provide the context, the other people's brains will make it up. And so this is uh, principle four, which is value framing. You choose your context. Choose the context that make your achievements seem big and your costs seem small. You have control over the way you communicate. And that's principle four. So just briefly then before we go to questions, um, if you have follow-up questions after this presentation today, you're welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm easy to find. Amanda Nyman Peters, there's only one in the world, so you won't get anybody else if you search on that. And I just also um, would like to highlight that the book uh, will start shipping this week in general. It's called Working with Influence, Nine Principles of Persuasion to Accelerate Your Career. And if you go to bloomsbury.com backslash UK and use the promo code INFLUENCE25, or one word, then you'll get 25% off your purchase uh, for this week. And that's all I, I plan to say formally. Yeah. I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh, well, that's fantastic. And just for anyone, uh, if you didn't catch that down, if you go to the Eventbrite link, actually the discount code was also, it's on the website uh, where 
um, when you click through to this uh, actual event and it'll stay up there on the CREATE website so you can go and get a copy of the book, which is well worth a read. Um, before I take like moderator's privilege to ask all the many questions I have, I just want to throw out, um, are there any questions in the room at the moment? Are there any questions online, Vanessa? Yes, no. Not yet. Fine. Excellent, because I have a talk. <laughs> um, and I think it's a, so I think it might be helpful because you, you've given us a taste and given us just like two of the principles. Do you think you can give us just in a couple of sort of minutes just the the bigger model of sort of where those principles fit with the bigger model? Yeah, sure. So I mentioned that there are three principles related to who you're speaking to. The first principle, principle one is status. And this refers to something that humans do, which is kind of a bit unfortunate, but we do it, which is within a given situation, within a given uh, group of people, human brains subconsciously create a kind of status ranking. And that status ranking sort of determines within that group of people, within that context, who they listen to. So to give an illustration, let's say you, you walk out on the street and you're amongst a group of random strangers and something happens, then a policeman or woman steps forward and, and, and tells you what to do. Your brain automatically ranks, okay, this is someone with formal um, authority and therefore you're more likely to do what they've asked them to, you to do than just another random stranger on the street. And so principle one refers to this human tendency to sort of rank people relative to a context. And it's really valuable to understand because often uh, there are situations in your career that you want to influence where you're the most junior person in the room. I've had it happen to me even recently when I've walked in I, and I've been uh, reporting to a board, right? The board members have um, uh, the right to make decisions with regard to what resources I get. If you've just started a new job and you're a junior person, oftentimes you'll be the most junior person in the room. So understanding principle one status, how the human brain conducts that ranking and how you can influence to move yourself up the totem pole in their brains within a given situation is super important. Principle two is about social imitation. That's about the effect of other people's behavior on our behavior. Again, how you can harness that relative to the audience that you're going to present to, speak to, meet with. Uh, principle three is affiliation. We covered that today. It's about recognizing that people's reaction is initially emotional and that you want them to perceive you as part of their tribe. So those are the three principles that are related to people. There are three principles related to perspective, which is how you communicate. Principle four is value frame. That's the context within which we put our messages. Um, principle five is called effort. I'm going to be posting an article online a little bit later today, my time about that. And it's about the fact that people are more likely to do things that are easier to do. And principle six tackles reasoning and the way you go about generating logical reasons to convince somebody and how you can vastly improve the reasons you use when you uh, make an argument. And then the last three principles are all related to your own behavior. Uh, principle uh, seven is called inertia. It's about reading what's going on and using that to your advantage. So Bruce Lee once said, be like water and flow through the cracks. That's the idea behind principle seven, flowing with whatever the situation is and using that flow of energy to your advantage. Principle eight is about how to avoid being distracted when everybody else is being distracted. And principle nine, execution, is precisely how you should practice speaking and holding your body when you're attempting to influence. So that's the three by three model. Um, they are, it's summarized, I think here in the back of the book, I have to go past the references. There's like 250 academic references in this uh, book. And then somewhere here we have the actual, sorry, don't have it on the slide, just have it. There we go, you can see this three by three principles there. You probably couldn't see that too well, but hey. So it helps people remember when and where to apply the principles.
Yeah, and it's a super manageable and really readable book. I mean, it's... Uh, it's Thank you. Um, it really is uh, a great book. Um, I want to pick up on something that I think is, uh, well, two of the things that you've mentioned, I think uh, are really hugely relevant to a lot of our listeners or people in the room as they're starting on their journey. Um, and I really lo like to book, you talk a bit about how often people with low competence sort of accrue, like achieve sort of status through having high <laughs> confidence. Um, I think we've all been uh, in that space. And uh, for many, how sort of what are the tactics, what are the methods you would say for people to build that confidence for themselves? So particularly when, you know, inevitably we could get steamrolled by people who have that low competence, that high confidence uh sort of frame to themselves but when you're put in a situation whether it's either in you know going through interviews particularly when they have a lot of the interviews for mm -hmm. days it's group work and or just in a standard kind of networking situation what would be your tactics for getting yourself to that space for of people with low lower confidence i think there are three key things to help you when you're feeling that you're lacking in confidence the first one is you need to recognize that people can't see it anywhere near as strongly as you think they can so what we know from studies of people who go into situations where they're feeling lacking in confidence is because it is such a huge factor in their psychological environment they think it's evident to everybody else but people are not very good at reading what's going on inside another human being's brain. They're really not. They're not even anywhere near as good at telling if someone's lying as they think they are. So um, first thing to recognize, you it's not written all over your face. It's in your head. So you need to recognize that other people are thinking about themselves and, and, and not feel as if your lack of confidence is being telegraphed out there. The second thing is to recognize that you can be effective even if you're not feeling confident. So rather, because when we don't feel confident, um, we tend to focus so much on that confidence, our key concern is, how can I feel more confident? But I'm saying your key concern should be, how can I be effective? How can I communicate what I've got to say effectively? Focus on that rather than being on confident, it being confident, because being confident is only a route to sounding effective. But practicing to give your key messages and to give effective answers to questions is actually what employers are looking for. And you can do that even if you're feeling lacking in confidence. And the third thing is for your key mass messages, practice saying them out loud. Don't just write them down. And this is something that humans do a lot, particularly when it comes to presentations. So we focus on creating our slides or writing down what we have want to say. We don't practice executing it out loud. And yet in the real situation, you need to execute it out loud. So the key questions that you think you'll be asked and that you can anticipate, you should be practicing answering them out loud as much as you can so that what you want to say flows off your tongue, even if you're really nervous in the moment. Does it make sense? That, that's uh, excellent advice. And you're so right. We spend so much time today building our beautiful presentations and then forgetting to practice them before we uh, go out. And so many job interviews today also include a presentational component or yeah. sort of submitting a policy brief and then talking about it. And it's really worth thinking, not just to put it in writing and then put it out there, but think about how we're going to communicate that. Um, I believe uh, we have some uh, questions from the uh, virtual. I can, see, I can see two questions. I can see one from Art. I think that's pronounced Art. Art D, he says, he or she says, what would you say is the most important takeaway from the book? And I suppose the key takeaway is that behavioral science demonstrates that the things that influence us are significantly different from our best guess about what influences us. Time and again, if you ask people what they think, they'll choose, choose certain things or messages or they'll say this is influential when it isn't what's influencing their behavior at all. So let me give you art and forgive me if I'm not saying your name correctly, I hope I am. Um, a small example. Let's say we want to predict what YouTube video goes viral. 
And so I take a panel of people and I show them a, a bunch of different videos and I ask them for their conscious opinion. What research tells us is that their conscious opinion has very little predictive value in recognizing what people actually go on to share when it comes to sharing videos. If instead you um, measure what's going on in their brain through neuroscience, you use fun functional magnetic resonance imaging to measure what's happening in their brain, and you can see a part of the brain lights up that is associated with reward, meaning at an unconscious level without me consciously recognizing it, by sharing this video, people are, I, I'm gonna be rewarded. People are gonna like me, they're gonna like it, or they're gonna enjoy the video that I share. It will make me look more popular. That is the best predictor of whether or not people go on to share it. But it's something they can't articulate. It's going on inside their head and they can't even observe it. And so what this book allows you to do is to understand more about what people typically do and how you can improve against your history of influence. How can you modify, tweak, change, suspend your current approach and act on an insight from behavioral science so that you can improve relative to your past history. And you certainly do not need to learn all nine principles. I actually recommend at the beginning of the book, pick one chapter. Pick one, just read one. Each one chapter is, I don't know, 10 pages long. Pick one, read through the 10 pages, practice applying that one, and it will help you. If you like that and you wanna continue, fine. Go ahead and do another chapter, but start with one principle and that'll be enough for you to see a return on investment for your effort. Cool, thank you. Um, before we go to the other question online, do you have any other questions in the room? Go ahead. Um, I just want to ask you a question about principle number one. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. I'm just stupidly putting I, my I ear closer to question. the computer, but I can hear you fine. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if you had any tips about how to go beyond um, this, this like this status and that people create the hierarchy in a group. Um, it's just from personal experience when you're quite young and the team yes. and stuff, you often find yourself being. Um, kind of mansplained by older people. Um, and I know mean, it's very uh -huh. but that happens to be quite a few times in, in serious meetings. Um, and I was just wondering if you had any tips um, on how to look past that and just make it bolder. <laughs> okay, so thank you for your question. Is that Ariana? Is that correct? <laughs> no, uh, oh, that's Jeff. <laughs> yeah. that, it's Jeff in the room. Ariana, okay. gonna, yeah, she's oh. she'll the third question. Okay, so, so similar question, sorry for that. So hi, hi, um, uh, person in the room. Um, so let me just first up and um, give you a little bit of warning about principle one status. And that is, um, it's a bit depressing how we behave as a species. <laughs> and um, I have to say, when I first started uh, researching in this area, um, I uncovered many things about way, the way the human brain behaves that you know weren't particularly palatable and weren't particularly fun and I want to highlight that at the end of each one of these principles at the end of every chapter there is a section called better than yesterday and in that section what I do is I say now that you know how this principle works this is how you can not only act on it for your own gain but you can use this knowledge to make things better around you. For example, at the end of chapter one, the better than yesterday section is about how to make the workplace a more inclusive way in a way that affects people's status ranking, because I've just been explaining the fact that we rank people, um, we rank people on physical factors as well, which is rather unfortunate. We rank them on things like how deep their voice sounds or how tall they are, et cetera. Uh, we don't know we're doing it. And it happens even if we, uh, consciously don't believe we're doing it, right? A lot of the research I do, I um, give people stories to evaluate. I say, this person did this thing at work, evaluate how well um, they performed, and I get a whole bunch of people to rate it. And then I simply change the character in the story so that they have a different physical characteristic and people change their rating. So, uh, uh, um, uh, principle one status, as I say, there, there is some 
material in there on, on, on us being biased. And um, I just want to warn you about that before you dive in. But OK, so let me give you some practical tips, tips for things that you can do when you find yourself in a situation where you are um, junior. In fact, where you are new, let's even say you're new and the rest of the group is already established. The way that you introduce yourself and what you choose to highlight about yourself will have a massive effect on your status, subconscious status ranking within the group. So what people typically do, and this goes back to the question that Art had as well, what we typically do and what's much more effective. What we typically do when we introduce ourselves is we say whatever comes easiest to us. So whatever comes easiest to us is often our job title. But a job title rarely means anything inherent, even within a company in a different department, compared to if you're dealing with somebody from the outside. So if you're new to a team or new to a company, typically you'll say something like, well, I just started two weeks ago, or I'm really new here, because it's what's in your head. But automatically, as soon as you say that, your status drops to don't bother listening to that person, right? In, in the minds. So your opportunity to speak within the group and your influence has just dropped. What I would recommend is you've got to think in terms of the context of that group of people and the situation that you're in. You don't need to go around trying to increase your status every single time in every single situation. Part of increasing your influence is being choiceful and recognizing in this meeting, in this situation, when I first meet the team, I want them to value me rather than just treat me as the newbie who knows nothing. So that's when you think in terms of two or three characteristics with which to introduce yourself that are both status invoking and true. To give you an example, maybe I'm only in this company, been in this company for two weeks, but previously I worked at BMW. BMW is a big brand name. It holds status. So when I introduce myself, I would say, uh, I'm Amanda Nyman Peters, and I've just come from BMW, where I was in charge of the budget for Western Europe, right? Doesn't matter that I'm new to this company, I'm highlighting something that is status invoking and true. You might have come straight from university, in which case you say, um, uh, uh, I, I am um, I'm now a member of your team, and I have uh, outstanding skills in data analysis and visualization that have helped me to demonstrate to people the value of analysis in a variety of contexts. So now I'm talking about skills I have that automatically give me a certain status. Now, what you don't want to do is go around telling everybody all day long, whoever will listen, that you went to University College London, right? Like nobody needs to hear that over and over again, or you will be perceived as bragging. And that's why it takes some skill to identify things that are relevant to that context that invoke you with status. But if you just open your mouth and say what most easily comes out of your mouth, chances are that you won't really help yourself in, if you're new, if you're lacking in authority or experience, et cetera. Or even if you just use your job title, it's often meaningless and people need something relative in order to understand how to value you. Does that answer your question? Does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> right. So you get, you're all set to go now. No more. <laughs> it's all, all set to go. Um, I am afraid we probably only got time for one more short question because otherwise my influence with the very lovely security guard on the door will diminish <laughs> and I will have zero status and will be able to use the room for the next three days. But uh, really, I just want to ask out of everything, I mean, the book is so rich on, you. you know, really backed up and I mean, it is a, a real journey, but it's so incredibly rich. Hidden in there, what's the one secret tip? There must be kind of, is there one favorite secret tip that's sort of somewhere in there? Well, I'm distilling down a lot, a lot, a lot here. But I think the, one of the key things that comes out in many of the principles is um, it's not just that people are influenced by, by things they don't recognize. It's also that people are far more influenced by people than they recognize and their emotional reactions to them. And one of the great kind of um, 
misconceptions that we have is that we constantly think in, at work in terms of competence, 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 hire the best people, force them to work with each other and you'll get the best result. But one of the reasons we think like this is because, again, we think that we're highly logical and actually humans are far more affected by the other people around them and their emotional and social interactions with them. So my number one, if I had to distill it down to, to one key insight, it would be how you treat people and how you make them feel matters vastly more in terms of uh, the influence that you wield in any professional environment, whether you can see that or not science can see that so just be mindful of that so i think uh that's something you could take away to um or maybe i'll just sort of just treat that just for quiet i just want to <laughs> sort of investigate that for like one second whilst i can so when we're put into networking situations so mate, who here loves networking <laughs> we love networking you love it who hates networking <laughs> Yeah, there's a few. I, I, I find it, it's very hard. It's a learned skill, right? What would be sort of your tip thinking about that, using how to make people feel is part of networking or to give ourselves that sort of skill in the networking situation? Well, so when you describe networking, I assume you mean so you're going to an event where there's 100 people and you're trying to get some kind of connection with a person there who could potentially offer you a job is that correct yeah connecting with people making sort of professional connections or potential job connections mm -hmm. okay so um first firstly i'd employ probably three different principles there my first principle would be principle eight which is about your behavior and that's called end goal focus and what principle eight means is you start by defining something you want to achieve and that's all you focus on. That doesn't mean that you stomp all over people in order to achieve it, just the opposite. What it means is don't also try to achieve this and this and this and this, because we're really not very good at hitting multiple targets. So if I were going into a networking event, for example, I might set myself a target such as make one meaningful connection with one person of potential interest. I'm never trying to assess, does this person have a job? Can they offer me a job? Would they buy from me? Are they a client? Because nobody's going to buy from you when they've met you for 10 seconds and nobody's going to do that. So my goal is make one valuable connection in some way. Now, then I spend the time while I'm listening to them speak or uh, while I'm reflecting after I've spoken or during the activities, thinking in terms of how can I make a meaningful connection with that person and ways to make them feel good or to have a meaningful connection. Often what I might have done, if there could be somebody at the event that is the person I want to make a connection with, I'll research them beforehand. I'll go and ask them a question about their work then automatically this is somebody who feels flattered because you've read what they did. And, and you, of course, it can't be something creepy like I found 10 photos of you in your pajamas with your dog online, right? That's not what you're going to say. I realized that recently you were, you've been working on a project to help people better understand blah, blah, blah. I find that really inspiring. It's, it's something that will make them feel good about you. And then they'll talk about themselves. And talking about themselves makes people feel good. And some of that transfers onto you. And then once you've, you're focusing on that person and you've built that positive social connection, you can reach out to them and ask for a little bit of advice or a little bit of help. But spend a good amount of time building the positive connection. And then at the end of it, perhaps ask them, oh, is there any problem at your company in this area that I could help you solve? Or... Um, do you know somebody who uh, needs help in, I don't, I don't know, sorry, data analysis of what I teach. So I always use data analysis uh, topics, right, or leadership. Um, you can ask for a tiny bit of help. Don't ever bother handing out your business card and asking for a job because you're just wasting paper doing that. Nobody's going to give you a job because you ask for one. Right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, keep your focus. Pick something, make a meaningful social connection with someone. If you haven't had time to identify someone and research them beforehand, you can do it on the spot. I've been at conferences where I've, I've looked someone up on LinkedIn and got a rundown and then I've gone and approached them. And um, actually, one time I did that at a conference about three years ago. It started a chain of interactions and eventually about six weeks later, the guy offered me a job. It wasn't a job I wanted. It was the Dean of Leadership at, 
a training. I'd, I'd just left being the dean of a business school. I didn't want to be the dean of something else. But it occurred to me that that whole chain of interaction happened because I just started with a positive social interaction. I wasn't asking for anything. I was actually asking him questions. I invited him to come to my school and see what we were doing there. Um, but yeah, set yourself a goal for networking. It just come out of there with some positive social connection. That's it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Amanda. It's been just such a joy. It's been absolutely my privilege. I hope that we get to welcome you here uh, in person one day and uh, we can talk more. Um, in the meanwhile, thank you for everyone who joined us online. Thank you for everyone who joined us in the room. Thank you for your participation. Uh, don't forget, if you want to make meaningful connections, join us tomorrow night at our <laughs> networking event where we've got our in-person open mic night. What would you do? Political science has got talent. What would you be doing if you weren't studying political science? Come and share us on the stage. I'll be singing. So it's one reason to come, if nothing else, uh, free drink and free uh, food as well. Uh, but so uh, come, bring your friends. Um, lots more tomorrow vis-a-vis -vis panels. We've got a workshop on um, threat intelligence. We've got um, a workshop with control risks on uh, um, how you do um, risk management. Uh, we've got uh, more panels in the afternoon. We've got exploring econ as well in, with, in conjunction with econ. Lots of stuff going on. Please come and join us. Dr. Amanda, thank you again. And You're very welcome. I do recommend the book. So and we look forward to reading your articles and hope to see you very, very soon.